So to start the semester, uh, it's a pleasure to have here Eduardo Vitral uh, from Institut d'Astrophysique de Paris. Uh, he's a PhD student there, and recently he got famous and uh, he was all over the news um, due to his discovery of a graveyard of stars in, the, in a, a globular cluster in the Milky Way. And uh, he was very kind to accept our invitation to come here today and talk about his work. So, Eduardo Vitral, thank you for being here with us today, and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Marina. Uh, and thank you to everybody at UFIX for being here uh, present. Uh, it's an honor for me to be pre presenting not only in my home country, but also uh, in a major institution uh, concerning astronomy and uh, other fields of science. So, uh, let's talk about science. Today, as Marina told, I'm going to talk about a graveyard of stars that uh, my supervisor, Gary Maimon, and I uh, happened to discover while performing mass modeling in a Milky Way globular cluster. So in order to give uh, some context, if you want some uh, more details about this work, I warmly invite you uh, to read the paper, uh, which is in open access in AMA, with the title, Does NGC 63397 contain an intermediate mass black hole or a more diffuse inner subcluster? And in order to give some context about why did we start looking for uh, this global cluster, first of all, we got to talk about intermediate mass black holes. So what are they? Well, intermediate mass black holes pose a continuity problem in black hole physics. Because if you go to your daily astronomy supermarket and you turn into the black hole section, you actually notice that black holes usually come in two shapes. You can never, uh, you can never have stellar mass black holes which are usually formed at the end of life of very massive stars uh, with masses usually above uh, 20 solar masses. Or in the other range of the spectrum, you have supermassive black holes residing in the center of major galaxies. And if you look at the masses of these two classes of black holes, you'll notice that while the first one goes from one to about 100 times the mass of our sun, the other, uh, the other class of black hole, the supermassive ones have masses spanning from a million to a billion solar masses. And have this huge gap here from about 100 to 100,000 solar masses where you just don't find enough evidence as you find for the other two classes. You have some candidates, but they are far less uh, numerous than the, the candidates you have for the other two classes. So since they are very difficult to find, uh, one, it's, it's very natural that uh, we uh, felt uh, felt uh, curious about it and went looking for it, right? And in order to look for uh, intermediate mass black holes, there are certain places where it's probably likely to, to find them. And uh, you can actually reason in the same way as this uh, mass uh, relation. So if you think about stellar mass black holes, they're usually found in binaries, uh, whether black hole binaries detected by LIGO or for example, X-ray binaries with a stellar, massive stellar companion. In, in the other range, you have the supermassive black holes, which, as I said, are usually found in the center of major galaxies. So they are associated with lots of stars in galaxy bulges. So if you look for the midway between this amount of stars, you can actually think uh, as one of your first guess about global clusters. Global clusters are this very compact uh, and uh, dense uh, stellar systems, spherically shaped by gravity, which have in usually about 100,000 stars with some variations from global cluster to global cluster. So the definition of it, uh, if you go look in uh, some general places, is that it's a collection of stars spherically shaped by gravity, which orbits a galactic core. And here is a beautiful image from the Gaia mission, which many of you have probably already seen it, with uh, the global cluster system in our Milky Way and some other uh, dwarf spheroidals. So the, the white points here, for example, here M5 or M68 here, they're all global clusters. And they stand kind of in the midway of this uh, stellar systems from binaries to galaxy bulges, as you can see. And, uh, and given that, uh, it's also interesting to highlight some important facts about global clusters. So they're usually very old. They're about the all these stellar systems uh, in, in their host galaxy, sometimes having the same age as the galaxy itself. And uh, they're also very metal poor. So basically that's, this correlates in a way with the fact that they are old. The, the, the stars that, uh, that, uh, that are present in global clusters usually have metallicities far uh, lower 
and then the ones you find in the solar vicinity. And as they are very compact and dense systems, it's all also very natural to understand that they will have many stellar interactions for the course of their evolution. And this can uh, take place as runaway mergers, st stars literally merging or colliding, and uh, dynamical friction as well. So dynamical friction is a phenomenon that can be explained by, a, can be a, uh, exemplified by this uh, scenario here, which I, I drew. Uh, so you have a mass massive star here, this blue one, and a less massive star here in the center. And as they orbit each other, they will exchange energy, they exchange uh, angular momentum. And for the course of their evolution, uh, of, this, of their, this exchange of energy, the less massive stars will actually reach outer orbits, while the more massive star will reach inner orbits as a consequence of energy equipartition. And if you think that this phenomenon can take place over many, many, uh, uh, for, for a very big uh, time scale, such as the, the life of global clusters, you will actually start seeing that this phenomenon can take, uh, can take place in, in bigger, uh, bigger scales by having a gradient of mass from the outskirts of the global cluster up to the inner, inner regions of the global clusters with more massive stars in the inside and less massive stars in the outside. This phenomenon is called mass segregation because you're indeed segregating the mass in a certain way. So another interesting fact about global clusters is that if you go back to at your, at your astronomy supermarket and look for the, black, for the global cluster section this time, they also come in two shapes. They have what we call the core collapse global clusters and the non-core collapse global clusters. So in this image here is a little difficult to find, but if you look sharply, you notice that the center of the core collapse global clusters have a, have a steep density profile, while the non-core collapse ones have a rather flat density profile, something like that, if the image is not convincing enough. So in order to convince you better about this, you can actually plot the stellar counts as a function of projected radius to the center of the global cluster. And here is an example of two global clusters in our Milky Way. So MGC 6397, which is the one that we were studying, and 6254, which is another global cluster, non-core collapse. And you can see indeed that the, the surface, surface counts of stars here takes this power loss shape in the inner regions for the core collapse ones, while here it stays rather constant. And the question that you, you might be asking yourselves now is, okay, so what drives global cluster to core collapse? And that can be explained by similar arguments that you explain why a star goes on uh, its red giant phase, for example. It invokes the Vero theorem for self-gravitating spherical systems. So basically what this theorem tells you, uh, it begins by telling that the gravitational pull will equal the gradient of, of pressure and, uh, and that applies for the region where uh, you have only gravity uh, acting in a major scale. And if you develop this equation, you actually find out that the gravitational potential energy of your system can be written as minus two times the kinetical energy, which I'll be uh, doing some analogies here with the temperature of the system. And uh, if you calculate the total energy of this self-gravitating system, which is the sum of the potential gravitational energy plus the kinetical energy, you'll see that minus two plus one will be minus one. And therefore, the total energy of your self-gravitating system will be minus the kinetical energy. And that's a very bizarre thing because it's telling you that the heat capacity of your system is negative. It's telling you that as you pump energy into the system, the temperature decreases. And that's completely different from everything that you see in our daily lives, right? If you want to increase the temperature of uh, something, we, you, what we usually do is to increase, provide energy like uh, heat something or do something like that, right? And here it's actually the opposite. So how does that behave in practice? How does that apply to global clusters? So imagine here that you have a global cluster. So it's in the regions, you can consider that it is self-gravitating and it follows well the, the Vero theorem. It is this orange part that you can see here. And have the outer regions of the global cluster, which can actually suffer some other interactions, such as tides from the Milky Way. Uh, maybe uh, they could have 
uh, small amounts of dark matter. Anyway, they're not uh, necessarily following uh, the Virotherium because they are not self-gravitation, self-gravitating uh, in a in a major scale as the orange the orange medium here. So imagine that. So so basically, what happens is that since the inside the medium will be uh, self-gravitating and follows the Virotherium, it has a negative heat capacity as we saw, and the other medium will be more of a normal system, let's say, and it will have a positive heat capacity. And if you start them with roughly the same temperature, and by nature means you have an increase of temperature in the inner regions due to dynamical interactions, for example, and uh, due, to, uh, due to the bigger concentration of stars, what will happen is that you can invoke the second law of thermodynamics, which tells you that the energy flow will go from the highest temperature medium to the lowest temperature medium. So it goes from the orange to the blue one. And since the blue one has a positive heat capacity, its temperature will increase as you're pumping energy into it. However, as you're pumping energy out of the orange medium and it has a negative heat capacity, its temperature will also increase. And you can see that you have a real potential for disaster here if the temperatures keep increasing. And indeed, the name of it is the gravothermal catastrophe because it seems like an impossible system. But it's not impossible at all because the, the, the increase of temperature that you're seeing is actually being counterbalanced by the gravitational potential energy from the Virotherium, which says that it uh, becomes more negative as the temperature increases. So how does you make uh, something which goes as minus one by R become more negative? Well, you shrink R. Okay, you make R become smaller. And that's what's in a, in a very general, general um, view, what's causing the core collapse. So the, the, gra the, gra the gravitational potential energy is becoming more negative and the stars are clumping inside and creating that inner cusp that you can see, while the stars in the outer shells tend to go uh, a little more loose. So once you have that, one uh, legitimate question would be, okay, so you have, these many globular clusters in our Milky Way, they are usually very old, as I, as I said. So they have under, undergone many uh, time scales of, uh, of evolutionary times, let's say. And, uh, and it would be very believable that most of them would have gone core collapse, but that's not what is happening. What is happening is that about a fifth of the globular clusters in our Milky Way have actually undergone core collapse. So it's, if, they, if they're that old and they have that many stellar interactions happening so fast, something seems wrong. Why not all globular clusters have undergone core collapse? In order to answer that question, I will ask you a little patience and I will come back to that once I explain a bit the work I did with Gary. So as I mentioned, we were trying to look for intermediate mass black holes in globular clusters and we wanted to do that by analyzing the velocities by, by performing a mass modeling of these globular clusters. So you have these many candidates in our Milky Way, but you actually have to remove many of them as well because some of them are very distant and we still don't have very precise velocities uh, to have good results. Some of them are rotating uh, very strongly, which is in disagreement with uh, the, the equation that you use to fit it, which is the genes equation that I'm going to explain later. And uh, finally, you have to find the data for your global cluster, right? So we were very lucky to have our data provided uh, by Andrea Bellini from uh, the Space Telescope Institute for the global cluster NGC 6397. So if you look closer at this global cluster here, you'll see that it is a core collapse global cluster. So it has undergone this kind of gravel thermal catastrophe that I just mentioned. It's also strongly mass segregated. So it does have this, uh, sort of gradient of masses as you go inside the cluster, the, the, masses will tend, the stellar masses will tend to be greater. And uh, it's also one of the greatest global clusters to study because it's the second closest from our sun. It's about 2.4 kiloparsecs away and uh, it's not too much contaminated by the Milky Way center as it is six kiloparsecs away. Now, another very interesting piece of information about this global cluster in particular, is that actually people before have tried to do the same thing. So Kemal and all in 2016 published a very nice paper where they say that there is a dark component there in this cluster and they fit uh, a mass of 600 solar masses roughly and they assign it to, to an intermediate mass black hole. So they say that uh, there was an intermediate mass black hole there of mass roughly 600 solar masses 
And therefore, uh, Gary and I had new data to try to investigate it and confirm or maybe uh, improve this, uh, this finding. So we did that with proper motions. Uh, since the former work from k and now was, uh, was using line of sight velocities from the MUSE spectrograph. So we also added to that Gaia uh, stars and HST stars. So Gaia stars, you can see in red, uh, they cover a big uh, part of the, the sky and they help therefore to account for the projection effects of their data. And finally, HST is the big hero, let's say when you're trying to to model uh, the inner parts. As you can see, it's very complete towards the center, especially compared to Gaia. And also has a very good precision. So to that, we added up the data from a and all uh, from, uh, from line of sight velocities. Uh, we actually used much less stars than they used because we added some more conservative filters, which I'm going to explain next. So yeah, this is the, boring part of the talk where I just explain fa fast what, what, uh, what is the data cleaning that we did. So uh, in order to consider good stars for our analysis, we actually were very conservative in the errors on the proper motion errors and the line of sight errors as well. We basically selected stars with uh, errors smaller than half of the peak velocity dispersion of this cluster. So it's here in this plot, you can see the error here in the y-axis against the magnitude for different data sets. So HST, Gaia, Muse, and Gaia line of sight. So we just selected stars here below this, uh, this wide threshold uh, with a magnitude considerably, uh, considerably faint. And after having selected stars which had good, uh, good astrometry, we had to separate some of them from the Milky Way interloopers that are drawn in data. And you can do that uh, in a pretty straightforward way by looking at the, your, your uh, proper motion right ascension against your proper motion in declination here. And you can see that there are two clumps. Usually there are two very uh, distinguished clumps, one of Glover cluster stars and one with Milky Way interloopers. So we select here a um, uh, naive region from uh, considering only Glover cluster stars. And the same uh, exercise was performed with Gaia data, uh, but in a more robust way because the contamination of Milky Way interloopers is more important for Gaia than HST. So you ha actually have more uh, of this clump here and we had to employ a more uh, a Bayesian probabilistic approach to do so. Uh, and after having done that, so having selected the stars from the global cluster, uh, according to their velocities, you can actually look now at their color magnitude diagram, which is uh, what is shown here. You notice that the main sequence of the cluster stands out pretty neatly uh, with some of the blue stragglers here and the, and the turn off point here and some high noise, noise region here. So we want to clean that as well because we, we don't want to uh, start with high photometric noise. Uh, and also we want to remove some of the binaries that could interfere the way we model our cluster because we suppose that the stars are pure tracers of the potential and these binaries could actually be somehow affected by their companion. So we removed them, uh, which are just these little dots here close to the main sequence, which are basically uh, unresolved binaries uh, that stand, since their luminosity sums up, they end up standing out of the main sequence. So remove that by choosing uh, confidence regions that you can see here. Uh, we choose a 2D uh, sigma region using kernel density estimation. And uh, the same exercise was then performed for Gaia. Now, another important filter that we had, especially for Gaia, because we had stars going uh, up to very high projected radius, was to limit up to where we would go. And that's because if you plot the velocity dispersion of your cluster here as a function of your projected radius, you'll see that it tends to increase up to a certain point here, which is not necessarily due to the cluster itself, but rather to heating of the Milky Way tides or maybe negligible amounts of dark matter, who knows? And therefore, there could be uh, something other than the cluster that we'll be trying to model, and that's not what you wanted. So we limited our maximum allowed radius to about eight arc minutes. Uh, and after that, we moved on to set some priors of our model. So we wanted to give our code uh, 
some good guesses and good uh, limits limits for uh, for the estimation. And since this cluster is strongly mass aggregated, as I mentioned, one thing that we did is not only to model it as a single stellar population, but also as two stellar populations of different mean mass. We did that by selecting the color magnitude diagram that you can see here, and we divided it uh, in a region where the velocity dispersion seemed to show a little small drift. And uh, we selected these two populations here and assigned mean masses according to the initial mass function of this cluster, with uh, its initial mass function slope low provided in the website of Holger Baumgart, which was this at the moment of the paper. Now, this is the big, uh, the big, the major player of our modeling, the genes equation. So the genes equation, which we treat in a purely Bayesian way, uh, is is highlighted here, and this has some very interesting uh, terms with uh, functions which you parameterize and try to estimate the parameters of these functions. So you have uh, the new term, which is the 3D density radius, uh, sorry, the 3D density of the cluster at the radius r, and that can be obtained by deprojecting the surface density that we can actually look with uh, real data. You have the velocity dispersion in the radial direction here is the sigma term, and here you have the total mass at radius r. So that's the only part where the mass actually enters in in our modeling. And it's a very important part because it's here that you're going to tell, for example, if you have or not an intermediate mass black hole where your mass function will peak at r equals zero, or if you have another uh, kind of uh, mass distribution with different components, it will all be included in this term here. And finally, you have this beta term, which is the velocity anisotropy term, which basically tells you how much uh, your orbits behave. If they're more tangential or radial, it's all comprised here in the velocity and isotropy. Okay, so we did our modeling and what were the results? So here is a, a small version of the table that is presented in the paper. The, in the paper, it's, a, it's more complete with a better explanations, but here are the three main models that I would like to discuss. So this model six here, it's a model where we allowed for an intermediate mass black hole in our cluster. And surprisingly, we fitted a value very close to the one Kamon and all had fitted in 2016. They had fitted something of 600 solar masses, and we fit something of 511 solar masses with similar uh, uncertainties. And OK, this is our fit with an intermediate mass black hole. We also tried the fit with nothing inside, just the luminous stars that are observing the cluster. And finally, we also allowed for a model with a dark, uh, a dark uh, component at the center, but not point-like such as an intermediate mass black hole, rather extended which, to, a, to a length that we would also be estimating. And we compared these different models by means of Bayesian inference, uh, which is these estimators called AICC and BIC, which I'm not going to spend too much time explaining that here because it goes quite technical. But if you, you're more curious about it, uh, well, one more time, I, I advise you to go look in the paper where we detail it better. And what those indicators told us is that not only we have a very good indication for a dark component in the center, so basically telling that this second model here was ruled out, as when choosing between an intermediate mass black hole and a cluster of unseen objects, as I will call them CUO, uh, it tells us that this cluster of unseen objects was, were, was much more uh, likely than, than an intermediate mass black hole, than a point-like uh, dark mass in the center. And one of the things you can do uh, to test it, so you can look at the corner plots and see if you have some degeneracies or some things similar. So here's the corner plot of our, uh, of our CUO uh, run. With here the mass of our uh, COO, uh, the logarithm of it, and the logarithm of the scale radius of the COO in our units. And uh, in order to test the robustness of this result to see, okay, maybe it was because we, we provided very narrow priors or something like that. So you can actually try setting different priors, very realistic ones, in order to see if you still recover the same values. And that's what we did here. So we provided a, a flat prior for the log mass of the CUO, which so could be anywhere from 10 solar masses to 
100,000 solar masses. And we also provided a Gaussian prior favoring uh, the scalar radius of the luminous stars in the global cluster, so which is much higher than the scale radius of this cluster of unseen objects. And still, the cluster managed to provide to find the same value as before, around minus one, as you can see here, which was a very good indicator that the, 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 the our estimates were robust. It was telling us that the data was very informative and that despite of the priors, uh, it was managing to re recover well this length of this cluster of unseen objects. And that's mostly thanks to HST, which is very complete in that region. Okay, so here's one more indicator that the COO is better uh, suited. So here's a goodness of fit plot of the velocity dispersion of in these two lines here, the massive population that we, that we fit. And here the less massive one as a function of the distance from the center of the cluster in our seconds. So you can see that uh, here, for example, for this model in this column, for the model with no dark component, the data which is shown in blue uh, doesn't agree well with the fits, uh, especially in the inner regions here in white. For however, when you add a dark mass in the center, it could be, for example, an intermediate mass black hole, and you see that indeed it fits better, but it still fails to reproduce uh, the radial velocity dispersion here at inner radial. And when you finally try the cluster of unseen objects, you see that the match is very good, agreeing with the uncertainties and showing a very uh, very good fit in general. So that was one more indication that this, uh, this result was quite robust. And another uh, finding that we had was that we had velocity anisotropy in our cluster. So basically we found that stars were not falling particularly radial or tangential orbits, uh, which is actually very uh, in agreement with the fact that the cluster is very old and its uh, orbits lost the memory of initial conditions. Also, uh, it's in good agreement with simulations that have simulated global clusters in tidal fields. And notice that radio, uh, outer, radio anisotropy in the outskirts uh, was consistently removed and, and uh, walked to an to a isotropic scenario through the course of time. Okay, so you might be asking yourself, nice, you have found that it's not an intermediate mass black hole, it's rather a dark population, but what is this dark population, right? What is it composed of? And in order to understand that, you have to do look at the, at the indices that we have. So we fitted a scale radius, which is about 2% of the scale radius of the luminous star. So it's very tightly packed in the inner regions of the cluster. We also found that, uh, so one another thing is that since this cluster is mass aggregated, as I mentioned, you would expect that if this uh, CUO is occupying the inner regions of the cluster, it must be composed of something which is more massive than the stars that we're observing. So there, it's composed of rather massive uh, tracers. And uh, finally, we are not observing them, right? They're not in our, they're not in a range of magnitude that uh, would be uh, well observed by HST, for example. Uh, so, they, they must be very faint objects or uh, they have maybe no luminosity at all. So if you gather up all, uh, all of these this indices that we have, it's pretty straightforward to understand that it must be compact objects. So whether white dwarfs, neutron stars or stereo mass black holes. And this is actually in very good agreement with uh, the counts of X-ray binaries that have been measured for this cluster. As you can see here in the cumulative distribution function against the scale radius. So at inner radii, you have this green term, this green uh, concentration here of X-ray binaries, which is much more important than the concentration of luminal stars uh, from HST and Gaia here in orange. So it's a good indice that we indeed find, we're indeed uh, looking at compact objects. And you might be asking yourself now, which kind of compact objects are we looking the most? So it's probably a mix of all of them, uh, but the, is there one that dominates over the other? How is, that, how is that distributed? And what we did in the paper was to look at uh, the, the, the zero age main sequence mass of the progenitor stars in the global cluster. So it's here in this x-axis, the mass of the stars when they were born. Uh, 
being in the function of this was the remnant mass. So the mass of the compact object, the remnant uh, from a star which with this initial mass here. So it's, it's this, uh, it follows these lines here from whether white dwarfs, neutron stars or black holes. And we integrated over all this range, uh, taking off the, these uh, regions in purple here, uh, this initial mass function of this cluster multiplied by the mass of the remnant. And what you find out is that you, you have uh, about a, a thousand solar masses in, in form of black holes, followed by white dwarfs here, and then neutron stars. This is in mass, because in number, uh, what you actually have is white dwarfs dominating with some hundreds of them, followed by neutron stars, and then some types of black holes. So of course, uh, what I did in the paper uh, requires some assumptions, uh, which I highlight here, one of them being that no mass loss was due to uh, no, no mass loss due to gravitational waves was accounted. We consider here a uh, universal mass function with a saltpeter slope. And finally, we assume that no black hole would be ejected from the cluster, which is something that we know that can happen by means of black hole mergers or tree body interactions. And here is where we probably got it wrong. So now, why and how can we eject a black hole uh, from a, a global cluster, right? So there are different ways of doing so. You can eject a, global, uh, a, block, a black hole from a global cluster by means of dynamical kicks associated with gravitational binary encounters. You can also eject them by means of uh, gravitational wave requires, recoils at the time the black holes merge. Uh, they, they will release an energy in a particular direction will most likely eject the black hole. And finally, you can also have natal kicks associated with the black hole formation at the time the supernova explodes and its gases uh, spell out the, the black hole from the, the cluster. So this first uh, scenario here is actually the dominant one. Uh, most of the kicks are these kind of kicks and they apply not only for single blast black holes as well for interacting with a binary black hole. And uh, they can actually have many kicks until a final ejection occurs. So you can have this black hole in the center, which is uh, kicked to the outer parts of the global cluster, but managed to fall back in due to mass segregation. And it goes on and on until it's effectively removed. So the second, uh, uh, the second scenario here often leads to immediate ejection because the energies involved with it are extremely high. But fortunately, if you're wanting to keep black holes in the cluster, uh, they only happen to about 10% of uh, black holes in a typical cluster. That's what we know from simulations. And finally, uh, there's this third uh, scenario here, which is still a little uncertain, but the general belief is that massive black holes, uh, which came from massive stars with low metallicity, tend to receive smaller natal kicks and should not affect that much uh, these other two uh, these other two uh, scenarios here. So as I told, this one is the dominant one and the one where we will focus right now. And now we can try to answer the, the, the question that I, I, we asked before, why not all global clusters have undergone core collapse? Well, the answer to that is that maybe they have in a particular way. So this work has been uh, there for a good amount of time, right? So Larson in 1984, actually uh, mentioned this, this work for the first time. Uh, and then there was also Merity and, and all in, in 2004. And more recently, uh, Kramer and all did a very nice work with Monte Carlo simulations uh, to try to understand this core collapse phenomenon. So in order to try to understand it, you have to have two concepts in mind. One of them is the virial radius of a global cluster, which is very different from a virial radius in cosmological terms. It's basically telling how dense your cluster is. If it's, as it has a small virial radius, it's very dense. And if it has a big virial radius, it's not very dense. And the other uh, radius that you want to analyze is the core radius defined as the project, uh, at the place where the projected density, which is half of the maximum value. So what the core radius uh, tells is basically if your cluster is undergoing core collapse or not. Because if it is a core collapse cluster, the core radius will be very small. And if it's not a core collapse uh, global cluster, the density profile will be kind of flat and therefore the core radius will be quite big. So 
What Kramer and all uh, did in 2020 was to see how much, uh, how did the core radius evolved in a global cluster as a function of its, its initial virial radius. And they did that by performing uh, Monte Carlo simulations with many astrophysical constraints, uh, very uh, well suited from what we know uh, from astrophysics. And they found that the initial cluster size, the initial virial radius of the cluster determines the relaxation time scale, how fast it will go on core collapse or not. And what they found was that the clusters which haven't undergone core collapse actually have their inner regions dominated by a black hole population. So here's what they actually told us. We have here the density as a function of radius, and we have the, uh, here a non-core collapse cluster with a rather flat uh, inner, inner density here. What their work uh, seems to propose is that you actually have here uh, black holes which have collapsed and you're just not seeing them because, well, they don't emit light and they're not necessarily interacting with other stars. So they say that this inner cluster of black holes is actually what is preventing the global cluster to core collapse. Uh, in other words, for the luminous stars to core collapse because it's rather removing the stars that fall inside by means of dynamical interactions and also pumping energy into the system and therefore uh, halting the core collapse as we saw before since it has a negative heat capacity. So here is, a, is an example of what they proposed in a, in a very nice figure that they had. So you can see four different clusters with different initial densities, if, sorry, different initial sizes, virial radius, radii, and uh, three columns, one of the number density versus the distance from the center. So you have here a very high dense, uh, density cluster against the not dense at all. You can see here the evolution of the, the core radius as a function of time and the number of black holes in the cluster as a function of time. So the cluster begins with no black holes and eventually the ma more massive stars will go undergo uh, supernova and become black holes. And you have this initial population of black holes in all the global clusters. And all of them, you have this non-core collapse shape that you can see here, right? And through the course of evolution, you still keep this non-core collapse shape, but what they propose, it's actually that there is all these black holes that we're seeing here are being here in the center, halting the core collapse of the luminous stars. But at some point, black holes will be ejected, which is something that Gary and I didn't account very well in our paper. And uh, uh, for core collapse global clusters, we believe that at some point where here, the amount of black holes is considerably negligible. You can look here at this part uh, in the dense cluster here, it core collapse because there is no black holes there to provide enough energy to halt core collapse. And therefore the more massive components end up falling in such as other compact stars, such as neutron stars, and there, and after that, white dwarfs as well. So that's uh, how they propose a core collapse to occur. So in order to have the core collapse, you would have to have uh, uh, your black hole population almost completely depleted from your global cluster. And here is the same plot. So in a, as a evolving with time from purple to yellow, so you see that all of them start with a non-core collapse shape. This one here keeps a two later times this non-core collapse shape because it has a high amount of black holes. It has an inner subcluster of black holes holding the core collapse. And here, the black holes are basically all, uh, almost all of them are, are uh, have gone from the cluster. And they actually have an inner subcluster of white dwarfs in the center. And this paper uh, was, came, recently some months ago an archive from Kramer uh, and all as well in 2021, where they propose these white dwarf subsystems in core collapse global clusters. And they did a very nice work by matching uh, simulations to the dark population Gary and I found, uh, which you can see here in this white dashed line, which is the scale radius of our, our um, of the dark population we measured. And it does match very well the amount of mass in, a in form of white dwarfs in their simulations. So for white dwarf fans, we have a lot of cataclysmic variables uh, probably to be studying in, in core collapse global clusters. Uh, 
you can have a pulse reformation uh, studies, type one supernova and other transient events, as well as in a more in the longer term, gravitational waves detectable by LISA from these inspiring white dwarfs. And uh, this is why science is very cool, right? You begin here with uh, KMO and now in 2016, which showed that, okay, this cluster likely has a dark central mass. And they propose it to be an intermediate mass black hole, a point-like mass. And then it, the, the came uh, Gary and, and I uh, and said, okay, we agree with you. There is probably a dark mass, but it's probably in form of not a point-like intermediate mass black hole, but a collection of compact objects. And it proposed that these compact objects would be uh, mostly formed in mass by black holes while in number by white dwarfs. And finally, uh, what uh, Kramer and all came in this year to say is that indeed you both found a, a dark mass, which is, seems to be true. Vitral and Maimon were correct to say that it's extended. It's not a, an intermediate mass black hole, but uh, it's not a form of black holes, but rather is a form of white dwarf subsystems. And this is, I, I personally really like this evolution of science where you start looking for something which you don't really understand and little by little you approach uh, the reality and who knows if we're going to improve even better uh, our model in the future, right? So all of these three works provide direct evidence of white dwarf subsystems in core collapse global clusters and in some way sort of indirect evidence that black hole subsystems are present in non-core collapse global clusters uh, if their theory is correct. So Summarizing what we did, uh, Gary and I started looking for intermediate mass black holes in global clusters. We found an inner dark population instead of an intermediate mass black hole, and we assigned it uh, as, a as a composition of uh, compact objects, which still seems to hold true. However, we initially believed that they would be dominated in mass by black holes, and later we have found out uh, with other models in the literature that they would actually be better explained by wi a white dwarf subsystem with hundreds of white dwarfs in this very uh, small region. And finally, that opens up an amazing uh, range of possibilities to study physics. So what is next? Uh, well, there's a lot of global clusters here in our galaxy, as you can see, and uh, we're trying to acquire more, more data for them. We are uh, analyzing also non-core collapse global clusters in order to see if we also find these clusters of unresolved objects now mostly composed by black holes, probably. Uh, we are collaborating uh, with new uh, with other scientists, such as Mattia Librelato and Andrea Bellini in the Space Telescope Science Institute, and possibly Kyle Kramer as well. And uh, finally, all of that will help us to have a better understanding of the role of compact objects in global clusters. So thank you a lot for your attention to listen to this graveyard of stars. And if you have any questions, I can try to, to answer them now.